So this brings us now to the 33rd study presentation for the week. Our first one in camp 1983. And this, of course, is... Sorry, it's my phone. It's a different thing. Uh, just to repeat that, study number 33 at the British Columbia in Camp 1983, and uh, this is the 7.30 study on the last Friday evening of our time spent together. It's hard to believe that a whole week has gone by since we last met in this, uh, well not here but in the other, other building, and yet another week has certainly gone, and our time together has almost ended, I hate to tell you that, but uh, facts are facts, aren't they? <coughs> this time next week I'll be in Arkansas, and the camp there will have begun, in fact, we began two hours ago because they have a two-hour time change between here and there. And I suppose by this time I'll, be, I'll be pretty well be in bed ha uh, having a good sleep. Let's turn back then to the story of Nicodemus, which we began to study in our previous uh, time. And um, the story, of course, is recorded in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. We're quite familiar with the scripture, so I shan't take time to read that scripture again. But if we turn now to the book Desire of Ages, page uh, 171, we'll pick up the thought that we began to study as our time came to a conclusion. Was it last night? Or was it, yes, no, the first thing this morning. No, last night, that's right. And uh, I'll read again the second paragraph on page 171 to bring us together again where we left off la last night. Nicodemus had heard the preaching of John the Baptist concerning repentance and baptism and pointing the people to one who should baptize with the Holy Spirit. He himself had felt there was a lack of spirituality among the Jews that to a great degree they were controlled by bigotry and worldly ambition. He had hoped for a better state of things at the Messiah's coming, yet the heart-searching message of the Baptist had failed to work in him conviction of sin. He was a strict Pharisee and prided himself on his good works. He was widely esteemed for his benevolence and his liberality in sustaining the temple service, and he felt secure of the favour of God he was startled at the thought of a kingdom too pure for him to see in his present state. Nicodemus had a certain righteousness or a certain holiness which um, passed in his mind for the real thing. Let's turn to Romans the 10th chapter and note Paul's comments where he makes a distinction between the righteousness of the Jews and the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10 and we'll start to read with verse 1 and pass on down to verse 4, 1 through 4. Paul said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. So, so there was zeal, which means earnestness and sincerity, but there was a lack of knowledge. So they were serving God, but not in the right way, and therefore not really serving God at all. Now verse 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. From the beginning of this week, from the very first study presentation, we recognise that holiness or righteousness is, uh, is two things. What, what are they? Obedience. Obedience and faith. Right. So let's put those words on the board again tonight. That holiness equals those two things to obey and believe. Now, <clears throat> if we'd gone to Nicodemus and said to him, now, do you obey the commandments of God? What would he have said? Yes, yes, I do. I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't commit murder. I've never killed anybody in my whole lifetime. I'm very faithful to observe the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath. I pay my dues to the temple and I have been very liberal on the positive side toward the temple service. So he'd say, yes, I am obedient. 
Now, in turn, if we said to him, are you a believer? Do you have faith? He'd say, sure, I believe that God exists. I believe the Messiah is coming. I believe Israel are the people of God. Certainly, I believe. So, in Nicodemus' mind, how would he rate himself as being a holy or an unholy person? Holy. Right, as a holy person. Now, of course, in this position of attitude, Nicodemus, of course, was simply expressing the supposed righteousness or supposed holiness which the majority of the Jews thought they had referred to of course by Paul in Romans the 10th chapter for they going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God now there is a righteousness which is of the law and there is a righteousness which is of faith and which of the two do the Jews have? the righteousness which, which was of the law and when Jesus Christ presented to Nicodemus a picture of the kingdom which he had come to establish, Nicodemus was startled at the thought of a kingdom too pure for him to see in his present state. Too pure. Now tonight we want to understand in clear terms what the difference is between the righteousness which is of the law and the righteousness which is of faith because a failure to understand this distinction of course will place us on the wrong side of salvation and we shall come up to the great judgment day like those folk referred to in Matthew chapter 7 who say Lord, Lord have we not done many wonderful works in your name we've cast out devils, we've healed the sick and done all these marvellous things and Christ will say depart from me you workers of iniquity I never knew you, right? and we don't want to be in that class of people now to my mind the very best place in the word of God to find the answer to our question is in the book of Galatians Galatians the third chapter we refer to the problem that Paul found himself confronted with in the book of Galatians as the Galatian heresy it was the Galatian problem of course and um, we'll just run back rather quickly over the first couple of chapters before we move into chapter 3 more particularly and um, after the salutations given in the first five verses of chapter 1 in which Paul as usual of course lays down the principle that God is the source and that Jesus Christ is the great connector and man the dependent receivers in verse 6 we find Paul saying I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel before we read any further then bear in mind that the book of Galatians was written after Paul had established the church in Galatia he'd gone there he'd preached the gospel of Jesus Christ he'd, he'd seen those folk delivered from their hedonism from their errors from their sins they've embraced the, 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 the truth as it is in Jesus they've obtained a beautiful new experience as a result but then later they had departed from the experience which they had uh, received and gone back to a legalism now I'll explain the term legalism more carefully a little later legalism in short is man's attempt to obtain righteousness by obeying the law whereas of course righteousness is a gift from God it is the indwelling presence of our Saviour's own life so, so we pass on then to verse 7 which is not another it is not another gospel but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ All right, now, I don't want to take time to take, to take every verse in this chapter Paul then goes on to tell how that the gospel that was given to him did not come through any human source whatsoever. And this brings to view the point, or helps, to see, helps us to see the point that um, was being made this point about one-man messengers and one-man movements. And the point is, of course, that when God calls an apostle or a messenger, then that man is taught of God and taught by God alone and Paul makes that point very plain and clear in the last half of the first chapter of the book of Galatians when he tells how he went to Arabia and uh, that he didn't receive the gospel from Peter or any, or any of the other apostles but of course they were men who in turn taught the people so God gave to them that they might in turn give to the people 
There is chapter 2 verse 2 says and I went up by revelation and communicated to, unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles but privately to them which were of reputation lest by any means I should run or had run in vain and now as we move down toward the end of chapter 2 we find Paul begins to give his dissertation on the actual gospel verse 16 of chapter 2 knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified but, while, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ we ourselves also have found sinners is therefore Christ the minister of sin God forbid for if I build again the thing which I destroyed I make myself a transgressor for I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me and, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness is come by the law then Christ is dead in vain right now let's go back to Desire of Ages page 172 for a moment and there's a very important paragraph on this page it's the first main paragraph incidentally and uh, we'll just read it through and pick up one particular sentence in this paragraph which will help us to understand the book of Galatians even better Jesus continued that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit by nature the heart is evil and who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean what's the answer no. not one Job 14 verse 4 no human invention can find a remedy for the sinning soul the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be out of the heart proceed evil thoughts murders, adulteries, fornications thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies the fountain of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure he who is trying to reach heaven by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility there is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion a form of godliness the Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old but a transformation of nature there is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether this change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit now the main sen sentence to which I wish to draw your attention is, is that one which says the Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old now when this statement denies that the Christian's life is a modified improvement of the old does, this not, does not this infer that there are such things as modified improvements of the old right there are such things but, th but that's not the Christian life as um, the statement now plainly says now let's lay on the board tonight the difference between these two things if we, if we can on this side we have a modified improvement of the old over here we have the new Now, as the statement said, as the scriptures, of course, verify very, very plainly and strongly, every one of us is born, we are born with an evil nature, which in the scriptures is likened to a thorn bush. And of course, a thorn bush has only the capacity for producing thorns. However, it is possible to make a modified improvement of a thorn bush by meticulously going around the bush and snipping off every single one of its thorns. Now, is that an improvement? Next time you pass the thorn bush, it doesn't tear you closed anymore, does it? And if, for instance, you could go to blackberry bushes without any thorns on them, would that be a modified improvement of a thorn bush? It would be much more pleasant picking, wouldn't it, than be snagged by those thorns all the time? So it is possible to have a, a modified improvement of a thorn bush, but remember this, when you improve the thorn bush, it is still a thorn bush, and as such has no capacity for the production of apples or pears or grapes or anything really worthwhile our eating 
Now when a person of course ignores the principle that there must be an eradication of the old and the establishment of the new before we can begin to live the Christian life then they devote their lives of course to working on the old and trying to bring out of a heart of hatred for instance a life of love and that's an impossibility. The fountain of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure. And um, so when Paul said a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ then before we found the truth about the new birth experience we looked to our works and we said now I have all these good works in my life I love to study the Bible I love to go to church on the Sabbath day I don't uh, do the things the worldly folk do I don't have their amusements and sins and so forth so we, we looked at what we did in our lives and those works or deeds were the assurance to us that we were on the road to heaven, right or wrong. Remember, remember those days? Right. And that's what Nicodemus was doing, wasn't he? He was looking at his works and saying, I do this and that and the other thing, and those works in his life were his assurance of salvation. But today... What do, we look, what do we look at as the assurance of our pathway to heaven? The presence in us of a new life altogether in the place of the old life. That today is the thing that we look to as the assurance that we're on the, on the road to heaven. So a man is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ by which faith we receive a new life altogether. Now let's move on now to Galatians 3 verse 19 to help us to understand this point better Paul then asked the question wherefore then serveth the law in other words we're not justified by the law what is the purpose of the law and of course he's referring to the ten commandments as given upon Mount Sinai and he says it was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator very good, now let's look now at what the scripture is saying. It is saying very, very clearly and plainly that the law was added because of transgression. Now if the law was added because of transgression, which came first, transgression or the law? Transgression. Right. Now of course you may tend to say the law came first because of your Adventist training, whereby you, it was emphasized to our minds that the law is eternally pre-existent in the past and eternally existent in the future which is true in a certain sense but according to this verse the message of this verse says that the law was added because of transgression and therefore transgression came first and then the law was added because of that transgression we'll of course unravel this puzzle in just a few moments now I think that we're all clear are we not on the fact that the law referred to in Galatians 3.19 is in fact the moral law of ten commandments as given upon Mount Sinai we know a question about that in our minds at the present time. Now, <clears throat> this law then has a, a, a limited uh, period of activity. First of all, there entered sin, then the law was added, and there's the schoolmaster. Perhaps we should read that verse right now. The verse in Galatians, the third chapter, and verse 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith but after the faith has come we are no longer under a schoolmaster so this law then was the schoolmaster which brings us to Jesus Christ and of course Jesus Christ is the seed referred to back in, in verse um, 19 and so when that law has fulfilled that office or work then that is the end of its purpose and it no longer exists as far as the true Christian is concerned so we have now a moral law with a very, very limited duration of service. It doesn't uh, go on forever and ever in the future, nor does it go back into the past forever and ever either. Now to help us to appreciate um, this and to reconcile this with the statement which do talk about the law going on forever, let's turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and we'll start with verse 1. Now my purpose of course in this presentation on the general theme of holiness which we've been pursuing during the week is to demonstrate the difference between that which men regard as holiness and that which, which is in fact holiness. 
And of course the discourse of Christ to Nicodemus was a very, very clear revelation of the false kind as Christ tried to lead him and did succeed in leading him into a true experience of righteousness or holiness. So now we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and we read these words. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts known and read of all men. I'd like you to notice the emphasis Paul places upon what they were rather than what they were doing. He says you are, not you do, but you are something. Let's go on and see now what they were because by, by um, his saying this we recognize that Paul regarded the law as being a picture of themselves in a certain state of, or condition. Now verse 3, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in, but in fleshy tables of the heart. When Paul made reference to tables of stone, what was he obviously referring to? The Ten Commandments as given back on Mount Sinai, wasn't he? What else? Okay. Now he says, you are not written in tables of stone, but you're written in the fleshy tables of the heart. So this means then that when Paul thought in terms of the two tables of stone as they were given back on Mount Sinai with the words of the law written on those two tables as they were then Paul saw that as a picture of people as they were down upon this earth with, with stony hearts and we know of course that uh, in the book of um, Ezekiel the Lord says they will take the stony heart out of your flesh so Stoniness then was a, was a picture of the spiritual condition of the people down upon this earth. And so when God brought Israel to Mount Sinai, the mountain out there in the desert, manifested his glory upon that mount, and gave them that law, he gave them a picture of what they themselves were and called upon <coughs> them to recognize their need to move away from that which they were to something which was living, alive, vital and productive. And that which was alive and productive, of course, is, is uh, referred to as living or fleshy tables of the heart. Right, so let's now draw the heart here. And this, this, of course, was the fleshy tables of the heart on which the law of God was to be written in the place of the dead, cold tables of stone. If we go a little further in the same chapter, we'll find that this same thought of the law being something dead and cold is developed by Paul himself. We read now from verse 4 down to verse 7. And such trust have we through Christ to God would, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter does what? It kills, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance which, glo which glory was to be done away now verse 7 said but if the ministration of death now what ministration of death the one written where tables in tables of stone which could only do what the ten. the ten commandments now he says that was a ministration of death not a ministration of life and that ministration of death was glorious because it did, it did fulfill a very important function in the salvation of mankind. But unfortunately, Satan has been very successful in, in perverting the role of the two tables of stone. Let's go back now to the story of um, mankind, the background to this particular presentation of two tables of stone which ought never to have been given to the people at any time in human history it was only given or added in that form because of transgression 
the sin of the people necessitated the presentation of that law in that form let's turn for instance to 1st Timothy chapter 1 the Paul makes a very important point in regard to the um, the Ten Commandment law <clears throat> and he speaks in, the, in, in these terms we take 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8, 9 and 10 where he says but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully knowing this that the law is not made for a righteous man the law is not made for a righteous man now why not? because a righteous man doesn't need it who's it made for then? but for the lawless and disobedient for the ungodly and for sinners for unholy and profane for murders of fathers and murders of mothers for, for manslayers for whoremong excuse me for whoremongers for them that defile themselves with mankind for men stealers for liars for perjured persons and if there be any other thing that is conscious of sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust so who for, for who then or for whom then is a ten, was a Ten Commandment law made? Lawbreakers. Lawbreakers, right? Now let's think of the matter on this wise. Let's suppose now that we're, well, we're thinking in terms of a person within whom the spirit of obedience has been established. And the spirit of obedience is also the spirit of love and the spirit of forgiveness. And the person who has in him the love of God will love as God loves. And remember the text we read back in John, the 15th chapter, where Jesus said that we are to love each other as he loves us, right? As he loves us. Now Jesus Christ loved us so much that he would come down and, and give only good in return for evil finally giving even his own life as a sacrifice to save perishing mankind now consider a person who has in him the love of God the love of God the actual love of God the spirit of that love that mighty redeeming power now that person literally loves his worst enemy his worst enemy and he loves his worst enemy so much that he returns him only good for evil that he prays for him that he blesses him he does all in his power to help and, and, and uh, advance that person. In fact, if we go back to Matthew chapter 5, we can read the exact words of Jesus Christ describing the experience of a person in whom the love of God is established. Jesus said um, in verse 43 and verse 44, You have heard, you have heard that, that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? do not even the publicans so be therefore perfect even as your father which is in heaven is perfect now if a person is living out that instruction from a spirit of obedience in other words if he loves his enemy from the very depths of his heart and he's, and he's totally preoccupied by, with doing good things to his enemy then what need does that man have, have to be told thou shalt not kill him what need is there there's no need because that man possessed an entirely different kind of spirit altogether Brent, what was the text you just read? Matthew 5 verse 43 to 48 Matthew 5 43 to 48 <clears throat> to make the illustration a little simpler um, you might not have quite gotten the point there I don't think I think every person in this room is a non-smoker and if you were to take a trip to Australia or to Europe or even across the United States of America or Canada you'd find a sign in the aircraft toilets or washroom which says no smoking in the aircraft washrooms now you would go there or I would go there and we would not smoke in the aircraft washrooms now why? because the sign said don't smoke? no, no. why would we smoke there? 
because it's not in us to smoke okay but another person goes there who is who is a smoker and he doesn't smoke in the in in the washroom either but why doesn't he smoke because he doesn't want to because the sign says thou shalt not smoke so in the case of one person who already has the sinfulness in him that person requires that thou shalt not law to stop him from doing what in himself he wants to do right and all thou shalt not laws, that is negative laws, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie and so forth, are designed to curb the person in whom is a disposition to do those things from doing those things. Right? That's the purpose of the thou shalt not laws. And of course, the result is that that person does produce a certain kind of righteousness, a certain kind of obedience. He doesn't go around murdering people, he doesn't go around stealing other <coughs> folks' property and he's called a law-abiding citizen, isn't he? But, and, and, and of course, there, there is a, a holding down of crime to a certain level in the country, but if you took away today from Canada or the United States of America or Australia or Europe, any other country in the world for that matter, if you took away the restraining thou shalt not laws, you suddenly find that Mr. Law-abiding citizen wasn't so law-abiding after all. And there'd be, be millions more murders and millions more robberies if those laws are removed. And so the thou shalt not law is designed to curb or control the disposition to do the wrong thing. And of course it is better by far than straight out anarchy or lawlessness, obviously. But it is still not the righteousness that God requires. And in the case of Nicodemus, not only, um, he, he didn't do wrong simply because the law said thou shalt not do it. He was, he was concerned with going another step beyond that and by the keeping of that law he hoped to inherit a place in the eternal kingdom he hoped to have eternal life so he had, he had an extra motivation beyond the fear of punishment there was also the hope of eternal reward there was a further motivation in this respect and that hope of eternal reward plus the fear of punishment led him to be a law keeper but is that the kind of motivation that God is looking for in his people? No, it's not. He wants the people to obey the law from within themselves. Now, if we go back now to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and let me just quickly review some of the points we learned back in the character of God studies. Now, God gave to Adam and Eve as a love gift, the beautiful gift of life, and that was a love gift to them which has been handed on to us. He gave them the love gift of a home in the form of the Garden of Eden. He gave them the love gift of powers by which they could enjoy living and, and fulfill um, desires and ambitions and so forth. And he gave them law. I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments now because the, the moral law really is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and thy neighbour as thyself. That's a very positive outgoing statement and um, it's, it is the great law of love which binds together the hearts of all God's creatures throughout the universe and when you truly love the Lord your God and your neighbour as yourself you will be a threat to nobody because then you'll do good to that person and not evil. Now the law was given not as a life giver but as a life preserver. It's a very common fallacy, of course, that um, people say, well, if the breaking of the law, for instance, takes away my health, the keeping of the law shall give it back to me. Now, it is true that the breaking of the law does take away your health, but the keeping of it doesn't give it back. All the keeping of the law will do will preserve what is left, nothing more than that. Let me, for instance, just briefly mention for the sake of those who haven't heard it before, we recognize, of course, that the breaking of the law, let's think in terms of health, because health is life, that the breaking of the laws of health do, do uh, cause us to lose our well-being and, 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 and smites us with disease and various troubles. And it's now become a recognized fact, or it's becoming more and more a recognized fact, even by doctors out there in the world, generally speaking, that there is a relationship between the way in which we live and the quality of life which we have. Those folk who uh, pay no regard to their health and eat and drink as they please and so forth and have very bad habits of living suffer, of course, by 
the infection of diseases and so forth. It's now become well and truly recognised that there's a relationship between smoking and lung cancer and, and these things are quite plainly seen. So therefore, the breaking of the law is a life taker. The broken law is a life taker. Now, if the broken law is a life taker, the question then arises, what is the unbroken law? It is a life Preserve. preserver, because you've learned better. You say that. But <laughs> until you have been taught better, people will always come back and say, it is a life giver. But, the broke, but, the, but obedience is not a life giver because God alone is the life giver. And therefore, the law was given as a life preserver. Now men do recognise this in certain fields. For instance, when I took pilot training, the instructors were very diligent to relate to me the association between obeying the laws of flight on the one side and, may, and, and staying alive on the other side. They talked about approach speeds and takeoff speeds and stall speeds and all these various other things that go with flying. And they really taught me in plain terms that my survival depended upon my, my strictly obeying the laws that govern the flight of an aeroplane. Now unfortunately, of course, they don't extend this to every aspect of human living, especially the moral field or the field of God's righteousness. And in some areas, of course, men totally disregard the relationship between obedience and the preservation of life. Now, very naturally, of course, when men broke that law, or they, they threw away their life preserver, then, of course, they now found themselves faced with death, but worse than, uh, along with that facing of death, there entered into them another spirit. And that was the most serious thing. There entered into them then another spirit, and what have we been calling that spirit during the week? Right, the spirit of disobedience. And that now entered into mankind, and the presence of that spirit in, man, in mankind needed to be curbed or controlled before it completely destroyed mankind. And so to curb and control that spirit, what did God then give? He gave a new version of the law, which finally appeared upon Mount Sinai, in the form of the Ten Commandments of the ministration of death and that law was a law which says to, to that evil spirit thou shalt not do what you want to do right and that was the purpose that was a, that was the first purpose of that law to reveal to curb or control this evil spirit of disobedience which was now in that person and of course that law involved the use of force the threat of punishments and so forth and going back to home government, which we talked about during the week earlier, we recognise that when, before we learnt the principle that the child must have put into him or her the spirit, a, a new spirit or the spirit of obedience, then the, then the other spirit was there, the spirit of disobedience, and we had to keep saying, don't do this, don't do that, stop doing that. How often you hear parents doing this, don't you? They say to the child, don't do this, don't do that, stop, 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 stop. And the poor harassed child becomes so frustrated and annoyed by this continual negative kind of training that he rebels against it more and more, right? And of course the parent has to use force in order to enforce this control of the child so the child cannot do what that child wants to do. And it's surprising how early in, um, in, in, in his life's history a child will say, just wait, he says to himself first of all, and then in defiance to his parents, just wait till I'm 17 or 18 and I'll do what I want to do. I remember a case of a boy of about, uh, I think about seven or eight years of age down in Australia <laughs> recently. His poor frustrated parents had tried so hard to get this rebellious child to behave himself reasonably and he said, OK, I'll do it today because I have to, but wait till I'm 70 and I'll do what I jolly well please. At seven years of age he was saying that. So that child, of course, obviously had not yet possessed the spirit of obedience. Now, the f as I said before, the first purpose of that law then is to control or curb this evil spirit but the second purpose of that law is to be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ now how does this glorious ministry take place as we come to understand the role of that law that law says to us the soul the sinner that shall die and that law paints a picture before us of what we are and what we are is already death because, because that stone, stone is dead. Stone is unpro unproductive. You can't get blood out of a stone 
and you can't get grass out of a stone either, <laughs> let alone fruit trees and, and things that are really worth having. So therefore, stone doesn't grow anything. <coughs> it's like trying to plant plants on the concrete path out there. They're just simply going to die for want of soil and for want of water and so forth and so on. So as that law then demonstrates to us, that even when we try and obey it, and we, and we try and keep it, the fact still remains that, that in us is this evil spirit, in us is death, the spirit of disobedience, and as we see that law telling us that we are doomed to die, that the law says you belong to me, and I'm going to have you eventually, I'm going to have your flesh and blood body eventually, then that leads us then to look to Jesus Christ as the life giver. We need to come back and there must be, in the beginning of course there was the work of creation and what now is needed of course is the work of recreation and what does recreation mean? It means creation all over again, doesn't it? A, a repeat, that little prefix means back or again or the same thing which was there in the first case, brought back again. In other, in other words, we need to be brought now by the schoolmaster to the life giver and who is the life giver? Jesus. Right, Jesus Christ is the life giver. He is the divine seed. And now he will give us back the life which was lost back there in the Garden of Eden. Now, the moment that that life is given back to us, then that life needs a life preserver. And what is that life preserver? The law, right? That life preserver then is the law, which now has the same function here as it had back in the Garden of Eden, exactly. But this law is not a law which, 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 which goes around and says, Thou shalt not. Now, do you suppose, for instance, that back in the Garden of Eden, nailed to trees here and there was, was a sign saying, Thanks for not smoking? Yes. Of course not. And you think that God said to Adam, Now, look, make sure you don't kill your wife. Thou shalt not kill your wife. Did he say those things to Adam? Of course not. Because there was no need to, there was no disposition. There is no spirit in them to do those kinds of things and therefore they did not need a law which says thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And after all said and done, what is more depressing than to have yourself surrounded by laws which, which tell you not to do what you want to do, which, what in your nature you desire to do. And I'm very, very thankful to know that heaven is not a place where God has to, has to hang up signs or make prohibitions so we find ourselves not... Uh, being obliged to, re to refrain from doing what in our very nature we want to do. Now let's in closing, as our time is almost gone, go to page 668 in the book Desire of Ages and read again the statement in regard to true obedience. Page 668 in the book Desire of Ages. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our minds and hearts into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, refined and sanctified, will find his highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of continual obedience, so the appreciation of the character of Christ through communion with God's sin will become hateful to us. So then, this is what Nicodemus had to learn. He had to learn that his punctilious and careful observance of the thou shalt not aspects of the law was not the kind of heart obedience that God was looking for, that he needed to have implanted in him another spirit, that the law was to be a schoolmaster which was to bring him back to Jesus Christ so we can again receive the life which is lost through Adam back in the Garden of, Garden of Eden and that, um, that he, needed, he needed the life giver to put into him the, the, the new spirit so he had, he, had, he had the new spirit, the spirit of obedience in the place of the spirit of disobedience. And we stop at this point as our time is now gone. We'll continue the study as we can come back together again tomorrow morning. Uh, are there any questions that you'd like to ask in respect to this presentation this evening? Very good then, let's take a closing hymn.